Thus, the merger of DreamNet and the Transatlantic Broadcasting Corporation will be the final, decisive step towards a whole new era of mass media, both information and entertainment. Changhet Ozobol gesticulated and smiled almost like a human being. His smile was indeed a display of human friendliness, not a threatening parody like most of his fellow Talenians, who had a hard time with human facial expressions. Our services are known throughout the galaxy, and we are glad that Earth has joined the friendly family of our clients and partners. The audience, almost the entire board of directors and major shareholders of TBC, applauded. Mills felt an endless despair and loneliness come over him. He had done everything he could, but it was not enough. All his efforts were simply swept off the board. Nobody even noticed him. He lost. TBC lost. Humanity lost. He wanted to leave immediately after the board meeting, but the excited crowd picked him up, whirled him around, and he found himself in the banquet hall, among snow-white tablecloths, dainty appetizers, and sparkling champagne in crystal. For a while he moved aimlessly in this brownian motion of superheated human gas, in which everything revolved around one, the most important, molecule, Tolinian. Ozobol's hairless lilac head towered above the crowd like a beacon, and Mills tried not to approach it, maneuvering between the people drinking. Some smiled at him, others looked at him sympathetically, like a man who had just been diagnosed with an incurable, though not fatal, disease. It was inevitable, came a low, calm voice behind Mills's back. The voice was soft, but surprisingly easily cut through the noise in the banquet hall. Mills turned around. Standing beside him with an untouched glass of champagne in his hand was Tulugak Egidson, the oldest board member of the board of directors and former mayor of Greenland's largest unipolis, Ilulisat. Mills knew Tulugak didn't drink alcohol, but preferred not to stand out at banquets. You know, our people have always been known for their spirit of independence, Igudson said. He inherited his height and robust build from his Norwegian ancestors, his cheekbone face with piercing slit eyes from his Inuit ancestors. But the equanimity of the ancient granite rocks of his homeland came from both lines. But even so, in a referendum, over 80% voted to hand over the national network to DreamNet. By the way, did you know that's a galaxy-wide name? The Telenians simply translated it into the languages of those with whom they made a treaty. Mills noted that Egidson used the cumbersome phrase, those with whom they made a treaty, instead of the simple and short partners. Consciously or not? Mills suspected the former. When the board made its decision, Egidson was one of the four who didn't vote in favor, even though he merely abstained. Mills was the only one to vote no. One was against, three abstained, and seventeen were in favor. I still think it was a huge mistake, Mills said. I'm sure we'll regret it in the future. Perhaps, Egidson said. But the people have spoken. What does it matter what we think if the majority have no regrets or fears? They've just been brainwashed, bought for shiny bling like savages. Suddenly, the excited hum of voices, the clinking of glass and porcelain, and the rustle of footsteps and clothing around them died down. And in the ringing silence that struck his ears, Mills realized that he had shouted the last phrase at the top of his voice. Egidson stared at him intently. Mills could not read on his stone-like face what the Greenlander felt. It seemed that this endless moment of frozen time would never end. But the silence was interrupted by the deep, strong voice of Changet Ozobol. Let me invite you to the demonstration room to view the recordings. We will present you with fascinating scenes from a palace coop on the planet Namal 5, a look from the battle deck of an imperial flagship at the battle between the Third Tuban Space Fleet and the United Squadrons of the Una's Empire, and much more. 
please come forward and take your seats. The crowd murmured, stirred, and flowed toward the doors that opened at the far end of the banquet hall, splitting around the still-standing mills and agedson, like a river flows around two moss-covered boulders. Perhaps that's the way it really is, Mills thought. Perhaps I really am just an old moss and algae-covered boulder, unable to fit in with the general flow of life. But why do I feel that this current will soon be cut off by a huge waterfall? Without another word, he shook Agatson's hand, turned, and walked toward the exit, trying not to make eye contact with the crowd. He never looked back. Contact with the Tolenians had first occurred eleven years ago. A research ship working in the Saturn system had encountered their automated probe on its approach to Titan. It didn't take long to establish communication. The Tolenians who programmed the probe had vast experience in such contacts, deciphering languages and understanding alien cultures. For two years, information was exchanged with the probe's artificial intelligence, and then the first Tolenian ship arrived in the solar system. To the disappointment of many, the great breakthrough did not happen. It turned out that the rules of the galactic community forbid the transfer of fundamentally superior technologies to underdeveloped civilizations. The term underdeveloped seemed offensive to many, but it was the standard galactic designation for civilizations that had not mastered interstellar travel. People could take comfort in the fact that after a certain quarantine period, a special intersystem commission of the Galactic Council decided whether the next candidates were ripe for joining the community, and if the decision was favorable, the civilization received a license to use hyperdrive and a perpetual loan to develop and build its own interstellar fleet. The standard quarantine period for Earth-type civilizations with many separate states and separate supranational entities like the UN, was about one and a half Earth centuries. However, the Telenians cheered up the incredibly disappointed people. They had a solution that could greatly shorten the quarantine period. Humans should simply join the galactic culture as early as possible, immerse themselves in the lives of other intelligent species, and get a feel for their way of thinking, philosophy, and culture. The Telenians had a special device that transmitted pre-recorded thought reprints of representatives of other species directly into the brain of the recipient. For the duration of the transmission, the recipient almost entirely immersed in the life of the inhabitants of other worlds while still retaining the awareness of his individuality. In this way, it was possible to pass civilization psych testing ahead of time and get approval from the Intersystem Commission. This is how the Dreamnet appeared on Earth. Of course, any coercion was out of the question. This was one of the primary conditions of the Dreamnet service. Following all the legislation, the Tolenians registered it on Earth as an ordinary mass media and entertainment entity. Then, they began installing transmission stations everywhere, retransmitting the reprints from geostationary satellites. The collection of reprints was regularly replenished by special courier ships that arrived in the solar system twice a year. Anyone could sign a contract with Dreamnet, after which they were given an individual mental imprint that allowed them to connect to the broadcasts at certain times of the day, or whenever they wanted, depending on the contract terms. Earth-based broadcasting corporations, network media, and independent content creators began losing the competition to Dreamnet. No movie or reality show, even the most ingenious, could compete with the authentic experience of inhabitants of other worlds experienced in full sentience. Of course, not everything was available. For example, humans could not perceive thought reprints taken from the methane-breathing inhabitants of gas giants with a lifespan of millions of years or cybernetic minds made up of swarms of nanobots. But even beyond that, the range of experiences was incredible. Dreamnet was buying up media companies one by one, replacing their broadcasting facilities with its own transmitters. 
Meanwhile, the streets of the cities were rapidly emptying. Cinemas, libraries, restaurants, and cafes were closing. More and more people signed a contract with DreamNet, and their only desire was to get home from work as soon as possible to connect to the next broadcast. The number of unemployed people who lost their jobs due to the DreamNet was growing, but the vast sums paid by the DreamNet allowed governments to provide an acceptable unconditional income to all citizens. Only a few stubborn cranks like Mills doubted what was going on. It seemed to them that the original goal of joining the galactic community and reaching out to the stars had been lost in the pursuit of new impressions and that instead of developing initiative and the desire for new knowledge, the DreamNet's thought reprints were simply robbing people of their will, immersing them in the endless pursuit of useless alien dreams. The Telenians dealt a severe blow to these dissatisfied people when they announced a year ago that due to the successful growth of DreamNet, the Inter-System Commission was prepared to shorten Earth's application process several times over. Suddenly, the stars had gone from a mythical utopia a century and a half distant to a real possibility in a decade or two. In his position on the TBC Board of Directors, Mills fought as hard as he could, but opposing the DreamNet was impossible. Defeat was inevitable. The decision took shape as he drove home from the office. The streets of the big city, once bustling with life, were almost deserted. Only occasionally was he passed by the cars of citizens eager to get to their evening broadcast. Mills gripped the steering wheel until his joints ached, though there was no point in it. The autopilot controlled the driver's actions. It would not allow a person to do anything dangerous to him or others. Another small bonus from the technology of the Tolenians. The galactic community paid no attention to the handing over of such trifles. It was possible to completely switch the car to automatic control, but Mills wanted to keep at least the illusion that he could control something. He drove the car into the garage and sat in it for a few minutes, thinking about what he would say to his family. Then he got out and walked resolutely into the living room. His wife Alicia and their two children, 13-year-old Alex and 8-year-old Lena, were half lying in the special capsule chairs that DreamNet had provided upon signing the contract. The first models came with special helmets, but the Telenians refined them according to human anatomy over time. These days, to receive a thought reprint, one simply had to lower one's head into a special cup-shaped headrest. At first, Mills was filled with rage, mixed with resentment and a desire to immediately pull his loved ones out of these leech cocoons that sucked on their minds. But he calmed down when he looked at his wife and children's relaxed, peaceful faces. They had made their choices, just as he had made his and a few unspoken and unheard words would change nothing. Mills returned to the garage and began to load all the necessary things into the car. He had a long, hard road ahead of him. Four large paralyzers on the main towers, Igidson said, handing the binoculars to Mills. And a few more on the roof. We'll have to be precise, or we'll get hit. Mills looked through the binoculars at the transmitter station. The openwork antenna towered above a squat building surrounded by a high wire fence. At regular intervals along the fence were towers, each topped by a device resembling a giant beetle with a fan of antenna whiskers, a paralyzer designed to stop unauthorized intruders. The similar beetles, though slightly smaller, were located on the roof of the transmitter's machine room. After the insurgents blew up several stations, DreamNet took measures to protect its property. At first, these measures only made the resistance fighters laugh. Simple fence, some strange gizmos on the towers, and no guards. Not a single Tolenian, or at least a human guard. However, remote fuses did not work in the paralyzer's fields. 
bullets and shells lost their penetrating power, and people instantly lost consciousness. The underground lost several groups, after which it became apparent that they needed new tactics, which Mills and Egidson and their comrades would try out now. The underground's command tried to dissuade Mills from participating, arguing that he was too important to the movement to risk him in a single mission. But Mills said that it would be mean of him to hide behind the backs of those who would test his proposal. When he was supported by Egidson, who possessed great authority, the command had to relent. The Greenlanders were the most powerful and influential faction in the underground. The guys from the tech team are confident it will work properly, Mills said. They tested it on compact models and got a 10-15 to 15 minute gap while the paralyzers changed the control frequency, so we should have at least seven minutes. Okay, Egidson replied. What's to come is what's to go. He pressed a button on his portable radio and said, All groups, attention, group zero, you first, then all according to plan. Start on my signal, all groups to report now, over. After receiving confirmations from all battle groups, Egidson looked over to Mills and said clearly into the radio, Take off. Repeat to all boards. Take off. Everything went even better than they had hoped. Special directional emitters jammed the control frequencies of the paralyzers, and the battle groups managed to take out the beetles before they started up again. The towers were blown up by rocket-propelled grenades, and the small paralyzers on the roof were shot by snipers, each with several 50 caliber bullets. The infiltration teams waiting at the edge of the 500-meter zone immediately rushed to the station, cut through the fence, broke down the door, and penetrated the engine room. The alarm should have already gone off at the central security terminal. They had no more than 20 minutes before a mixed rapid response team of Tolinian techs and human commandos would arrive on the scene. If it came down to a confrontation with them, it would be a matter of much more lethal weapons than the paralyzers, and the underground was trying hard to avoid casualties among the humans, even those who collaborated with the DreamNet. A young tech team member opened the cover on one of the transmitter's devices and deftly disconnected colorful wires and entire bus bars, connecting them to a homemade device he had brought. This device was to embed a program into the DreamNet's network that the underground had high hopes for. Mills looked at the youngster. His last name was Vancic, and he was from a family of Eastern European immigrants. Like many others, they had migrated to Greenland during the onslaught of the Great Desert. Almost a teenager, a typical computer geek. He seemed like a natural raw material for DreamNet. But here he was along with Mills and the others who had not given up. Got it, Vancich said, pressing a few buttons on his device. The upload will take four minutes. Mills nodded. What's up out there? He asked Egidsen into the radio. It's quiet so far, came the Greenlander's calm voice. But it will not last long. Choppers from the sixth base can be here in ten minutes. They know we have man pads, said Mills. You think they will still risk it? We'll soon find out, answered Egidson. Hurry up. Mills looked at Vancic. You heard him, he said. I hope everything works out properly. Vancic shrugged. The upload is on schedule, he said, keeping his eyes on the small screen. There's not much left. And at that moment, the first missiles fired from the DreamNet's attack helicopters began to explode outside. Excellent stuff. It's one of the best in quite a while. There's a reason you were promoted to sector manager. I think the next promotion is just around the corner. Chang'et Ozabo listened to the praise in silence. Only the sensitive antennae on his temples moved, which, for Telenian, indicated the carefully concealed excitement. His plan had worked. 
no one had believed at first that any additional profit could be made from such primitive creatures. The plan had been to simply process them according to standard procedure and upload them to the vaults for inclusion in the general network as basic memory cells. But he convinced management to take the risk. And he won. I thought we could somehow harness the barbaric energy of these savages since they were such fierce opponents. It would be a waste to simply dispose of them. But I confess, I had no idea my plan would be so successful. Oh, you have no idea how much, my dear Chang'e. Your history of the resistance has been a smash hit on many worlds. Mills and his bandit buddies are now among the most popular characters in the galaxy. In addition, strangely enough, such broadcasts also have a favorable effect on the processing and memory cells. Productivity increases up to 15%, and in the case of some closely related species, even up to 25%. The warden blinked his lateral eyelid twice, wiping away the bluish mucus that came from the excitement. Strictly between us, there are rumors about giving you a seat on the expanded Council of Archons. So you may be my colleague shortly, dear Chang'et, and I will be overjoyed. Chang'et shrugged his shoulders three times, showing respectful agreement. But let's get back to business as usual, said the warden. I assume that the loading is generally on schedule. Four billion cells have already been shipped to the memory center, Chang'et replied. And we expect that barring any surprises, the remaining three billion will be loaded in the next two local years. Unfortunately, a few tens of millions have been lost in processing, but the losses are within standard estimates. As for my entertainment project, special areas with some free and partially connected cells have been set aside to keep the underground eager for action. Fine, fine, said the warden. You know, your last idea with the computer virus sent to the orbital transmitters to disconnect the cells is amazing. I can't wait to see how things unfold next. Changet Ozobol modestly covered his nose slits. I must confess that the idea was not mine, he said. The insurgents came up with it all by themselves. Of course, none of their viruses can harm our network. But we disable some of the cells to not disappoint them. That way, they'll continue to operate at maximum energy. Oh yes, of course. The warden was quiet for a moment. What was that you were saying about surprises? Weren't you referring to the problems with the underground? Changet Ozobol was sincerely surprised. Why, of course not, he said. I was referring to bad weather and sunstorms. There can be no surprises from the underground. He thought for a moment except maybe in terms of great entertainment. <laughs>